good afternoon and welcome to our fourth webinar that's going to go deeper into depth on analyzing results from a evaluation of professional development. Just to let you know up front, this PowerPoint will be available for you to download so that you can review any of the notes that you would like and access the links that are on the PowerPoint slides themselves. If you have any content questions, please submit them through that chat box and we'll answer the questions at the end during the question and answer session. If you have further questions or comments, please include them in the evaluation form that you will access at the end, and we will be sure to address those questions in the next webinar as well as in a written Q&A document. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. If you run into any technical difficulties throughout this, uh, please email support at fcrr.org. Again, that email address is support at fcrr.org. And we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Dr. Kuhn. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of what uh, she's going to talk about today, Dr. Kuhn is going to let you know about the evidence standards, the clearinghouse evidence standards for strong studies, as well as some best practices, how to calculate attrition using the clearinghouse standards, how to calculate baseline equivalence, and then how to do statistical adjustments. After that, we'll hear from Dr. Latera Osborne-Lampkin, who's going to talk a little bit about qualitative analyses, some considerations if you were to do a, a mixed methods design, and then we'll answer any questions that you have about today's content. Okay, now, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Adria. So um, for those of you who um, have been following along in the webinar series, you'll remember that um, the first webinar we talked about best practices overall, and then in the second webinar we talked about a few considerations in your design to help ensure you are planning for a study that will meet WWC standards with or without reservations or will generally improve the credibility of your study. So today we're going to highlight some of these same aspects um, just in the, in the, um, in the um, framework of analyzing your results. So as we've done in the past, um, we're going to go ahead and just highlight some of the um, things you want to make sure you do to be aligned to the WWC standards. Um, of course, you want to make sure that you have two treatment groups, um, I mean two groups, a treatment and a comparison group. Uh, for an RCT, you want to make sure you have low attrition. For a QED, um, you're going to be uh, wanting to make sure you have baseline equivalence between your treatment and control groups. And then um, the contrast that you're looking at um, between your treatment and control groups, you want to make sure that that is actually designed to measure the impact of the treatment. You want to have valid and reliable outcome data used to measure the impact of a treatment. You want to avoid confounding factors. You want to make sure that your outcomes are not over aligned with the treatment. And you want to make sure that you have the same data collection process, same instruments, um, same time of year um, for both the treatment and control groups. And then another uh, re list of reminders. Um, oops, I want to make sure I go to the right slide. Um, you want to make sure that um, you also have pre-specified and clear primary and secondary research questions. You want to uh, talk about the generalizability of your study results. You want to have clear criteria for your research sample eligibility and your matching methods. You want to make sure that your sample size is large enough to detect meaningful and statistically significant differences between your treatment and control groups overall and for specific subgroups of interest. Um, your analysis methods should reflect the research questions, design, and sample selection procedures. And you want to have a clear plan to document the implementation experiences of the treatment and control conditions. And our last uh, slide of reminders, uh, looking at um, if, you, um, if your study is published and reviewed by the, by the WWC, there's three potential ratings um, if it is eligible to be reviewed. Your study can meet um, group design standards without reservations if it um, involves a random uh, if your groups are, are formed through a random process and you have low um, attrition, 
if you have high attrition, but your sample was formed through a random process, but you can document baseline equivalence, then your uh, study can meet group design standards with reservations. And then if your uh, sample was not formed through a random process, uh, then you have to demonstrate baseline equivalence. And if you are not able to do that, then your study would not meet group design standards. And all of this um, we've talked about in previous webinars, and you can find more information about um, the uh, different ratings in the WWC handbook. So today we're going to talk more about attrition. We're going to talk more about baseline equivalence, um, specifically looking at how the baseline equivalence is calculated and then um, what adjustments are made for non-equivalence. We'll talk about the effect size corrections, um, the cluster correction, and the multiple comparison correction, and then handling missing data. So for RCTs, um, the WWC is concerned about both overall attrition, in other words, the rate of attrition for the entire sample, and differential attrition, or the difference in the rates of attrition for the intervention and comparison groups because both types of attrition contribute to the potential bias of the estimated effect. So overall attrition is equal to the number without observed data divided by the number that's randomized. The differential attrition is uh, the difference between uh, the treatment with the, the, your uh, sample in the treatment group without observed data divided by the number of your treatment group randomized minus your control group without observed data divided by the number of your control group randomized. But uh, prior to deciding whether you have high attrition uh, or, or a study has high attrition or low attrition, the WWC convenes a review leadership team. And that team develops the protocol that will be followed in the review of studies. So in developing a review pro protocol, the review team leadership considers the types of samples and the likely relationship between attrition and outcomes for studies in the area. So when it has reason to believe that much of the attrition is unrelated to the treatment status, then more liberal assumptions regarding the relationship between attrition and the outcome may be appropriate. For example, the review team leadership may choose the liberal standard if it believes attrition often arises from the movement of young children in and out of school districts due to family mobility or from random absences on the days that assessments are conducted. But on the other hand, if the review team leadership has reason to believe that much of the attrition is explained by the interventions reviewed, such as um, high school students choosing whether to participate in a dropout prevention program, the more conservative assumptions may be appropriate. So in order to be deemed an RCT with low attrition, um, another thing to, to know before we look at the next slide that shows these attrition boundaries, a cluster RCT that reports an individual level analysis must have low attrition at two levels. First, it must have low attrition at the cluster level, and then second, the study must have low attrition at the subcluster level with attrition based only on the clusters remaining in the sample. And um, that's done um, so that the study doesn't double penalize for cluster level attrition. So this next slide will help um, to um, explain it um, further with a visual. So this slide gives you the attrition boundaries with uh, the green boundary indicating um, you know, uh, low attrition and then red high attrition. So the choice of liberal or conservative assumptions results in this specific set of combinations of overall and differential rates of attrition that define the high attrition and the low attrition to be applied consistently for all studies in an area. So for a study in the green area, as I mentioned, attrition is expected to result in an acceptable level of bias even under the conservative assumptions because what you have um, You've got your overall attrition and then your differential attrition. And so all of the combinations of overall and differential in this green boundary indicate um, low attrition. But um, for a study in the red area, attrition is expected to result in an unacceptable level of bias even under the liberal assumptions. 
Therefore, the study must establish baseline equivalence of the post-attrition analysis sample to receive a rating of um, meets uh, standards with, with reservations. Because you can see in this red area, even though you have an overall attrition of, um, say, uh, 5 percent, you've got this differential attrition of um, 11 percent, meaning that one of your groups has much larger attrition than the other. So for a study in the yellow area, the judgment about the sources of attrition uh, for the area determines whether attrition is high or low, as I mentioned. Again, the choice of boundary um, is specified in the review protocol. So if the review team leadership believes, again, that the assumptions, the liberal assumptions are appropriate for the area, a study that falls in this um, yellow area is treated as if it were in the low attrition green area. But if the review team leadership believes that the conservative assumptions are appropriate, then a study that falls in um, this range is treated as if it was high attrition or, in other words, in the red area. For baseline equivalence, um, for continuous outcomes, um, it's determined by the difference between the mean outcome for the treatment group and the mean outcome for the control group divided by the pooled within group standard deviation of the outcome measure. In other, words, in other words, it's the standardized mean difference. The actual formula is in the handbook, and so you can refer um, to it if, if um, you would like. But also in the handbook is information on when you have dichotomous outcomes. And in that case, um, baseline equivalence is determined by the difference in the probability of the occurrence of an event between the two groups. And again, more information about um, the actual calculations can be found in the handbook. But for differences in baseline characteristics that are between 0.05 and 0.25 standard deviations, the analysis must include a statistical adjustment for the baseline characteristics to meet the baseline equivalence requirement. A number of different techniques can be used, including regression adjustment and analysis of covariance. The critical factor is that the appropriate baseline characteristics must be included in the analysis at the individual level, or the, the unit of the analysis. A difference in difference adjustment is necessary when baseline differences are not controlled for in an analysis. The WWC applies the difference in difference adjustment to effect size calculations based on an unadjusted group means based on unadjusted group means when the study is a QED with differences in baseline characteristics less than 0.05, and the study did not already use a better um, method to adjust for the pretest differences, such as, as I mentioned, regression analysis or ANCOVA. An RCT uh, with low attrition and differences in baseline characteristics regardless of the magnitude of the baseline differences. And also an RCT with high attrition and differences in baseline characteristics less than 0.05. There are two scenarios for this adjustment based on the pre-post test design. If the same measure is used for both the pre- and post-test, an adjusted mean difference is calculated before calculating the effect size. If the pre- and post-test are different measures, then the pre-test effect size is subtracted from the post-test effect size to report the adjusted effect size. While there is more detailed information um, available on this difference and difference adjustment, it is important to note that this adjustment will affect the magnitude of your study findings, so it's always best practice to account for differences in baseline equivalence. If in your study you assign clusters, such as schools, teachers, or classes, to conditions, and then intend to analyze data from a subcluster, such as at the student level, you will need to account for the cluster design. Subcluster units in the same cluster are more likely to be more similar to one another than they are to subcluster units in another cluster on your outcomes of interest. So this mismatch problem occurs when random assignment is carried out at the cluster level, for example, at the school level, and then the analysis is conducted at the individual level, um, for example, at the student level but then the correlation among students within the same clusters is ignored in computing the standard errors of the impact estimates. The standard errors of the impact estimates generally will be underestimated, um, which will then lead to overestimates of the statistical significance. 
The WWC applies a clustering correction when the unit of assignment in a study is not the same as the unit of analysis and the authors did not statistically correct for the mismatch between the unit of, an of assignment and the unit of analysis in the original analysis. For example, by using um, NHLM analysis. And so, again, it's important to note that a clustering correction affects the statistical significance of the reported results, but not the effect size. So the basic approach to the clustering correction is to first compute the t-statistic corresponding to the effect size that ignores clustering and then correct both the t-statistic and the associated degrees of freedom for clustering based on sample sizes, numbers of clusters, and an estimate of the intraclass correlation, or ICC. The default ICC value is 0.2 for achievement outcomes and 0.1 for the behavioral and um, attitudinal outcomes. The statistical significance estimate corrected for clustering is then obtained from the T distribution using the corrected T statistic and degrees of freedom. So as with base differences in baseline equivalence, it's best to practice, uh, best practice again to account for clustering in your planned analyses. And, and that's why um, you, you might notice a theme, that's why we're bringing these things up now because as much as you can plan for these things in your study design, um, then uh, you will not have these uh, corrections applied um, to your results. Another correction that affects the uh, statistical significance of the reported results is the multiple comparisons correction. It is widely understood that, that the more comparisons that a study reports, the more likely the study will incorrectly find a result to be statistically significant due to type 1 error, which is also known as false discovery. This is a concern for the WWC as the number of outcomes that are statistically significant is a factor in the uh, clearinghouse effectiveness rating of a study. So the WWC uses the benjamini hochberg correction to reduce the possibility of making this type of error. This correction accounts for multiple comparisons or uh, multiplicity, which can lead to inflated estimates of the statistical significance of your findings. So the benjamini hochberg correction is used in these types of situations, these three situations. Studies that estimated effects of the intervention for multiple outcome measures in the same outcome domain using a single comparison group. Um, studies that estimated effects of the intervention for a given outcome measure using multiple comparison groups. And finally, studies that estimated effects of the intervention for multiple outcome measures in the same outcome domain using multiple comparison groups. And the authors did not report adjusting for multiple comparisons. So information on the steps to making this correction are provided in the WWC handbook. The correction is made only when there are significant findings reported. Again, it's best to consider the need to correct for multiple comparisons in your analysis plans. Okay, and um, the last slide that I have is just on some highlights on handling missing data. So for um, the WWC accepts several methods for handling missing data. One is a very short for, straightforward approach where authors analyze units or individuals that have complete data without adjusting for missing data. Another method that's accepted is, uh, again, individuals that have complete data that's needed to calculate impacts but also have the data that's needed to adjust those impacts for any uh, covariates like, for example, student gender, race, uh, ethnicity, um, et cetera. Studies can also work with the complete case data but adjust for non-response using um, non-response weights. And then in the case of low attrition RCTs and only with uh, low attrition RCTs, multiple imp imputation and maximum likelihood techniques can be used. But it's important to keep in mind here that while imputation techniques can be used in low attrition RCTs, imputed data cannot be used to meet the attrition standard. Um, and again, there's more information about this um, uh, in the handbook and really about all the slides in the handbook. Um, it provides a lot of information um, that can help you as you plan your study and I really uh, encourage you to review the handbook and the webinars that are, the links to the webinars um, where you can um, uh, just review all these concepts and, and learn more information about them. 
So uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. And now to Latera. Good afternoon. So the evaluation profession has led to an increase in the use of multiple methods, including combinations of qualitative and quantitative data. Qualitative and quantitative designs differ both conceptually and in terms of the methodological approaches employed. Qualitative methods permit the evaluator to study selected issues, cases, or events in depth and detail. It's essentially concerned about understanding behavior from the informant's perspective. The fact that data collection is not constrained to predetermined categories of analysis contributes to the depth and detail of qualitative data. Quantitative methods, on the other hand, use standardized measures that fit diverse, various opinions and experience in predetermined response categories. One important way of studying program implementation is to gather detailed, descriptive information about the program, about what the program is doing. For example, what are the teachers experiencing in the professional development programs? And while there are various qualitative designs and methods for data collection, I will discuss two types of qualitative methods for data collections, participant observation and interviews, with a, with a specific focus on considerations for analyzing data gener, gener, generated from these methods. Systematic and rigorous observation involves more than just being present and looking around. Skills for interviewing involves much more than asking questions. Moreover, data analysis bringing order to data, organizing what is there in patterns, and categorizing and the description units also requires a systematic approach that requires various considerations. So when analyzing qualitative data, you should use an iterative approach. That means it requires you to cycle back and forth throughout the process and it should be guided by prior data collection and analysis. You should also use multiple reliable researchers for analysis and interpretation. Reliable in the sense of making sure that multiple researchers, researchers are consistent in which the data is being coded and the inferences being made from the data. Developing an audit trail is also essential. You're documenting the, and outlining the steps and decisions made for data analysis throughout the process. You should also document the basis for inferences and using evidence from the data to support those inferences. Finally, you should establish structural corroboration or coherence. This is a process of gathering data or information and using it to establish links that eventually creates categories. We will discuss five considerations when analyzing qualitative data. that is applicable to qualitative analysis and broadly in interviews and observations specifically. Triangling the data, ensuring representativeness, looking for competing explanations, analyzing negative cases, and keeping methods and data in context. Good research evaluation practices obligates the researcher and evaluator to use multiple methods multiple data sources and multiple researchers and evaluators for, to enhance the reliability and reliability of the findings. For example, the use of different interviewers helps to avoid biases of any one different data collector and interviewer working alone. Multiple researchers and evaluators can also facilitate the use of multiple perspectives or theories to help to interpret a certain set of data. There are some practical strategies for triangulation. For example, you might compare types of interview data, focus group data with semi-structured interview data. You might also compare interview data with other types of data. For example, comparing your interview data with observation data or comparing your interview data with other documents. Another example might be to validate your observational data with other documents, as well as survey data as well. In terms of participants, you can compare what participants say in public with what they say in private. For example, there are times in which individuals will also participate in individual interviews as well as your focus group interviews. Making sure that those, those findings are consistent across is very important. You should also check for consistency of, consistency of what participants do and say over time and compare the perspectives of individuals within and across stakeholder groups. For example, you're comparing the perspectives of teachers with what others are saying as well as other participants in your study. 
Verifying fit and work. What is discovered during analysis must be verified by going back to the data and examining the extent to which the emergent analysis really fits the program and what's being observed. By fit, we're saying that the categories must be readily, not forcibly, and applicable to and indicated by the data. By work, we mean that they must be meaningfully relevant and to be able to explain the behavior under study. Essentially, what are your findings saying should be true, a true representation of all the overall data that's present? One barrier to credible qualitative findings stems from the suspicion that the analyst has shaped findings according to his or her predispositions or biases. Being able to report that you engage in a systematic and conscientious search for alternative themes, divergent patterns, and rival explanation enhances credibility, not to mention it's simply good analytic practice and it's the very essence of being rigorous in the analysis. So it's important to look for rival and competing explanations, that is, those cases that do not quite fit the dominant pattern. You may employ an inductive or logical process, but essentially the process involves looking for clues that lead to different directions and trying to sort out when the direction make, which direction makes the most sense given the data. Comparing alternative patterns will not typically lead to the clear-cut, yes, this is support, versus no, there is no support kinds of conclusions. You're searching for the best fit, the preponderance of the evidence, so you're weighting the evidence. Closely related to testing of rival explanations is the search for negative cases. Our understanding of qualitative patterns is increased by considering instances in cases that do not fit the pattern. These are exceptions to the rule, or for evaluation purposes, cases that elucidate the findings. Examples that do not fit help clarify the limits and the meaning of the primary pattern. The discovery of negative cases or counter evidence to a hunch in a qualitative analysis does not mean it's immediate, it's immediate rejection. You should investigate the negative cases and try to understand why they occurred and what circumstances produced them. As a result, you might extend the idea behind your coding to include the circumstances of the negative case and thus extend the richness of your coding and your analyses. Finally, the evaluator must be careful to limit conclusions to those situations, time periods, persons, and contexts to which the data are applicable. The importance of reporting methods selected and the resulting data in the proper context cannot be overemphasized. Keeping things in context is a cardinal principle in qualitative analysis. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Osborne Lampkin. That was really helpful in helping us think about some of the qualitative aspects. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions about anything talked about today, Please submit those in the chat box and we will answer those questions. Um, just a quick reminder that the um, PowerPoint slides will be available for you to look at in the future. Also, we had one question about the availability of these materials for people who are not attending the webinars and they will be available. Uh, via the links from the RHEL Southeast website and IES websites um, and eventually on the YouTube channel so that you can access all of this information and hear us talk about them. We have one question come up um, already about um, attrition and missing, looking at um, missing data. So someone asked, in the case of low attrition RCTs, but you still use um, missing, a missing data design, they asked about multiple imputation or list-wise deletion, how those are viewed by the What Works Clearinghouse, and is one considered better than another? So I'll pose that question to Dr. Kuhn. Um, I, I don't want to speak for the Clearinghouse, but I certainly will run the question um, by them when we do our questions and answers, but to provide um, feedback in response to the question, um, there's so much information on missing data and how to treat it, and it really depends on how much missing data you have. Is the missing data um, completely at random, um, you know, or is it um, related to, you know, a factor in your study? You know, are all, you know, is all the missing data, um, you know, uh, um, students with, um, you know, uh, low SES, or, you know, is it 
related to one of your variables. So there's no real clear-cut answer, but um, taking, you know, if you have missing data and it is um, missing uh, completely at random and you don't have a lot, then, you know, list-wise deletion may be just as good as multiple imputation. Um, but if you, if the level of missingness increases, um, then multiple imputation might be better. Um, and so I, I can't give one clear-cut answer without knowing the scenario. Um, but in our, uh, in our, um, you know, when we answer the questions, I'll, I'll um, uh, give an answer and point to several resources that can help um, you determine the best approach um, in your study. Great, thank you. Okay, that was the last question that we had submitted so far. Um, we'll hang out here for a second as you send your questions in. Okay, another question that just came up. The webinar is reviewed while we're clearing house standards for strong study design, but does the standards for study reviews apply to writing pro uh, professional development grant proposals? So I'll just give a brief answer to that. Um, what we are showing you today is what represents the strongest level of causal inference and what allows you to make causal inferences. So we're just trying to show you uh, ideal set of study uh, design. But of course, we all know the world of schools can be quite messy and all of those things aren't always possible. So we're just showing you something to strive for. All right, the next question, could you mention again where and when we can access uh, the questions and answers? So after this set of um, five webinars, we'll uh, produce a set, all the questions and the answers in a written format, and we will post those as soon as we can um, get those completed and get approval for that to be posted. So we'll say soon, but won't give you an exact date that I don't know if we can hold on to. Any other questions from the group for the analyses? If you come up with any other questions, uh, please bring them with you to the next webinar, our last webinar, on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Also, as you sign out, make sure you please respond to our feedback survey that will pop up as soon as you, you close out of this. Your feedback so far has been very helpful in thinking about what questions are still out there and help us to address those questions. Um, we've got one more question. Can you talk more on waitlist control? So I'm going to take a guess at what you're interested in in terms of waitlist control groups. Um, as Dr. Foreman mentioned in our very first overview webinar, it's always um, a good idea and a good ethical practice to when you randomly assign groups to a treatment or control group to make that control group a waitlist control. What that means is that they will then get the treatment at uh, either the next school year or at the end of the study. Uh, and that's usually a good ethical practice, especially if your treatment is shown to have positive impacts on outcomes. Uh, very good follow-up question about the waitlist control group is, can the waitlist control group of teachers choose any existing PD programs? Again, this is up to you and the uh, plans for your design, um, but one way I've seen people do um, compare a professional development program is to have another professional development program for maybe another area. So if you're doing um, your treatment group gets professional development in a reading curriculum and your control group gets a professional development in a behavioral, a new behavioral initiative within the schools, then you can use that as each other's comparison groups um, and then maybe the next year switch which ones that they get. So it just depends on the goals of what you're evaluating, but you can certainly um, compare one or more 
professional development on different topics, I wouldn't expect to find uh, big differences between treatment and control groups if you use professional development on a similar topic, though. So. Let's see, the, the next question is what percentage of missing data is acceptable? And, and that's another, um, you know, there's, there's studies um, that look at the percentage of missing data and how it influences um, or how much bias you get based on that um, level of missingness, but it varies by what your outcome is. And um, again, it varies by um, is your missing uh, completely at random um, or is it uh, missing at random? Those are two different um, types of missing data. Um, you can have um, a design where you are field testing an assessment and you have a planned missing data design. And so in that case, you have a lot of missing data. You have 66% missing data, um, perhaps on, on um, different forms. But in that case, it's um, you know very thoughtful design and the missingness is treated as completely at random. So it's not, um, I, I can't give you an answer about what percentage um, is acceptable because it depends on so much, um, so many uh, factors. Um, but I can again point um, in the in the um, answer document point you to some resources that can help you um, look at some of these uh, pieces of information and how they how they impact um, the uh, level of missing data that is acceptable. Another question that we got: Are what are some common ways of quantifying qualitative data? Um, so I'll let uh, Dr. Osborne Lampkin talk a little bit about that. One of the um, methods that's most used, that commonly used, is content analysis, and I can provide some resources on that. And content analysis essentially involves you're counting instances of what you're seeing in the data itself, and so it enables you to actually quantify your your overall descriptive data based on those inferences using, of course. A, what we call an a priori coding framework. So typically with content analysis, you want to have a framework that will guide that analysis and then you, of course, develop the framework as you go. But in terms of the most commonly used practice for um, quantifying qualitative data, it's content analysis. That's, that's the analytic approach to doing so. Okay, thank you so much again for participating today and we appreciate the questions that you've sent through. Please continue to submit those questions as you come up with them uh, when you exit out in the feedback form, and we will look forward to speaking with you again on Thursday.